Okay, hello people. Um, thank you for joining me. I I feel honestly I feel very honored to have my guest today. His name is James Clements, and I've talked about this man before in my videos, and I think he is one of the premier electronic music producers on the earth today. And I don't say that lightly because I love electronic music and I have for many years. So James, how are you? Tell us how you're doing. Not too bad. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, I haven't seen a lot of interviews with you, at least on YouTube. So I, I'm honored that you come on here. Thank you very much. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know, <laughs> like, I felt like I, I berated you a little bit on my videos. Like, come on, James, let's do this. <laughs> so I appreciate you. Um, against your better judgment, I, I appreciate you coming on here. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I, f I felt like it was, you know, a good a good opportunity to do something I haven't or haven't done in a long time or don't usually do anyway. So you know, it's it's a new ground for me too, I guess. Yeah, well, I, I deeply appreciate it because, um, yeah, you didn't have to do this. This is your time, and that's the most precious commodity, I think. So. Um, True. So I'll just start off with super softball question. Um, I, as an American, I'm kind of interested in where, where you come from, um, you know, where were you born and how did you get, how did you get into this type of music? I'll talk about the drum and bass music. I mean, I'll talk about all your music, but I, I'm really excited about what I feel is a, is a certain um, period of music in the nineties, especially that I feel like you're bringing back that nobody else is doing that. Um, but yeah, I'm just interested. Um, yeah. What are your roots? Did, were you a DJ? When did you decide to produce music? Um, and yeah, what are those, some of those early influences? So it all went back to high school, really. Um, got a big up my friend, Chris, Chris Marshall, but every interview uh, where i've kind of told this story i kind of have to have to big him up because like he was the one that sort of got me into like electronic music really i mean i was kind of kind of already sort of into it like i i, I was listening to like 808 state and art of noise and stuff like that around about the sort of 91 92 but i was also really really into like um the sort of uk indie rock scene like you know Mm -hmm. groups like the charlatans um in spiral carpets stone roses ocean color scene etc you know that that was like a, a big big love for me early on so i had these kind of sort of um like groups of friends like it was kind of funny because like the friends that were into like, the indie music were all like, oh, fuck the dance music. And like the friends that were into the dance, oh, fuck that guitar crap, you know? So I was like caught in the middle of this a bit, but uh, I guess I kind of sort of leaned more towards the um, the electronic sort of thing. And um, yeah, I guess one of my earliest memories is uh, Chris came into school one day and um, he had this tape and he said, I, just, I got this tape from my cousin who um, who's been like just recording like the pirate radio stations like mm -hmm. around his area yeah. mm -hmm. uh, check it out and um we were fortunate in our high school we had this um thing called the language lab and it was like for teaching like foreign languages but they had these little tape decks in which you could sort of um sit with a partner put headphones on you're supposed to put in like obviously the the lesson tape or whatever to learn from and then you know talk it backwards but Obviously, you know, we were just like, oh, we can just listen to music, <laughs> you know, no yeah. one's gonna no one's gonna know. So um so yeah, we kind of sort of snuck in there um like at dinner time and um we just like sit listening to this music and just being totally like blown away by it. And I guess at the time it was sort of night to kind of rave stuff like hardcore before it became a sort of jungle and you know, mm. well and truly before the whole drummer bass thing happened and um mm. Yeah, we were just uh, totally mesmerized by it, just, just blown away by what we we're hearing. It was like, it was brand new. It was totally original and it was a very much a UK thing at the time. And um, yeah, we just felt very fortunate that we'd sort of kind of stumbled upon it and we, we loved it. And um, before long, we were buying, you know, the tunes we were hearing on these on these stations and stuff like that. We were going into record shops every 
weekend with whatever allowance our parents gave us, which wasn't much to be honest. But right. you know, it was enough to start like a uh, a very sort of modest uh, record collection, and um, it was um, not shortly after that. Um, I forget his name. Some some guy we knew that was in the same um, school school year as us. He came to us and he said, um, "Have you heard about this uh, radio station? This this pirate called um, Reality FM. Um, they are looking for DJs." So I said to Chris, "I was like, well, should we go for it? Should we like apply?" And we were both like, "Well, neither of us know how to mix. <laughs> you know, neither of us." <laughs> Yeah. know what we're doing really we would simply just be like presenting the music and you know giving shouts out to our mates and stuff and like putting posters up all around the school and mm -hmm. it was but it was just a lot a lot of fun and um that was that was my kind of early sort of entry into it really yeah well i think a lot of and i don't know if this i i can definitely appreciate with the pirate radio angle because it, it seems like I did a little bit of that too, and I, I ended up just training myself to DJ. I don't know if mm. you had that same experience, but I didn't have. There was no rule book in how to beat mix, and this is, you know, we had turntables right. then. We didn't have the tech now. It was you throw a record on a twelve hundred and you find the pitch and you match it, right? And no one, no one taught me how to do that. It was just kind of love of the music and loving those details, right? Yeah, I think it was. Um... It was hearing an early LTJ Buckham mix. Um, I think it was the. Actually, I'm actually I'm not going to try and guess which one it was because uh, <laughs> my, my memory is not that good. So, <laughs> but anyway, I remember it was either it was either Buckham or it may have even been Groove Rider, but um, mm. one of those early guys anyway. And it was like we were just um, sat around listening to, to this mix, and then. For some reason, all of a sudden, something clicked. I was just like, mm -hmm. that's how you beat match. That's how you... And then I went straight to the decks, and I was just like, I tried it. And, you know, it was, yeah. you know, all over the place. But I was kind of getting the hang of what I was doing. And, um, you know, a couple of weeks practice. And, you know, I was I was getting, you know, some pretty good mixes. And, and right. both me and Chris were just like, shit. Okay, we, we've, <laughs> we've cracked it. You know what I mean? You know, we, we yeah. know what we do now. So, right. and... um with that came like okay well what if we start writing our own tunes you know mm -hmm. it'd be great if we could actually sort of play our own tunes on on our radio shows as well yeah. um we didn't get that far i mean literally within a couple of years the radio got like, busted by the uh, dti so mm -hmm. they got down and um and our stuff just wasn't up to scratch at that time. We, we were just, um, I mean, we were just two kids messing around on like um, an Atari ST and an Amiga and just literally four channel um, tracker programs and um, just putting samples together and um, layering beats and effects and, you know, just, just rudimentary kind of, you know, building blocks of how you would uh, start a track, you know? Yeah. But yeah, yeah that was, that was it though. That was, that was the, um, I think that was the moment for me then I was just kind of, I have to be, I have to be doing this. Mm -hmm. This is, this is like, it was almost like a drug to me. I, I needed more. I needed to do it. I just needed to be creating and, and um, yeah, that was it from then. Yeah. yeah. It kind of branches into something I want to ask you in a minute here, but um, yeah, to me at the time as someone who DJed around the exact same time, I remember the punk crowd had a hard time, at least this was my experience, but here in the United States, obviously it was way different than the UK, but with r the rave scene, they had a real block when it came to, I think it was just the music, but to me, it was about that approach you were just talking about. To me, it was like a new updated version of the punk ethic. Like anyone can do this. You get it some turntables, yeah. you throw yeah. it out and you figure the shit out. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. I think it's, um, it was very much a sort of DIY thing. A lot yeah. of, uh, I mean, when you kind of sort of hear a lot of tracks from sort of when they came out back in 92, 93, there's, you go back and listen to some of the tunes that I loved back then and you can hear all the mistakes now. You know, now that obviously, you know, I've 
got all this experience behind me and stuff like you can hear like certain breaks that are unquantized like the mixes are like really terrible you can hear it's being <laughs> done on like, on absolute budget equipment but <laughs> yeah that was part of the beauty of it and yeah. that was part of, like, the charm it was like it was yeah. you know you had access to this equipment or like some people would just go and like rent a you know a studio for a couple of days so they could just have access to a sampler or something like that and, and then it was as simple as that you know you had you you had your track it was on tape or that or whatever and and you then just either got it pressed to some some record or if you were lucky you got it signed to a label and mm -hmm. took that you know it was took um took care of that aspect for you so right yeah very much uh, the same kind of diy yeah. yeah yeah it was it was about reading the crowd too i mean you could I remember going and seeing DJs like Sasha, who was a, a beautiful technical DJ, he could literally mix beats perfectly behind his back blindfolded. But, and I, I, I like Sasha mixes, I'm not trying to denigrate that at all, but I, I kind of always preferred those DJs who would slam those tracks together and create a vibe. Like a, a DJ that did that really well in my experience was Carl Craig. He was one of those guys that right. came for shit, but it didn't make any difference, you know? I can't actually say I've heard too many Carl Craig mixes, but I absolutely love his music. Oh, me like, too. Huge Detroit techno fan since uh, yeah. the, yeah, that was like a big, um, big kind of wake up call hearing that kind of music. Just like, okay, this, this exists. You know what I mean? It was like, mm -hmm. okay, why? Yeah. Yeah. So, as an American, I, that was the stuff that I was weaned on, but then in the UK, you guys were taking all that stuff and turning it on its head, head. And that's when people like 808 State came along. And I'm so glad you mentioned them because to me, pre-build uh, is one of the most essential electronic albums I feel is, is vastly underrated. That, that was more or less my gateway into Acid House, really. Um, that yeah, one. that was good. I would say for me, the seminal one is, is 90 yeah oh my god but yeah over, over i mean you guys over here got united state 90 which yeah is they repackaged it and it wasn't wasn't as cohesive i actually went i went into hmv in um I, actually i forget where it was at the time but um looking in the import section and i was like mm -hmm. what's this united state 90 is this the same and i looked at this track list and i was like well it's got some of the tracks on but I, yeah so I just took a chance on it because obviously back then you went into a music store, you couldn't really listen to anything like that. So it was just yeah. like, okay, okay, well, I like it. I stay, I'll grab it. And but yeah, um, there was some cool tunes on it, but I felt like cohesively it didn't work as well as the album that we got in the in the UK. I agree a hundred percent too. And they use different versions too. Yeah, uh, specifically a Pacific, which I think you know, if you're gonna pick any song. The 808 state completely changed the landscape with in my opinion it would be that yeah one hell of a tune yeah oh my god yeah i mean i still listen to it to this day i i, I don't know what kind of equipment they were using it couldn't have been that high tech right no they had everything i mean if you look at the back of um the xl sleeve it actually lists the whole studio equipment oh you're kidding i have that album i've never even looked at this yeah, yeah it's great um so yeah they had like pretty much every synth you could think of and um, oh, no it, shit. It, was, it was a pretty crazy setup but yeah I, I remember the reason I, I mentioned them was like one of the very very first records I bought was um the seven inch single of Cubic and Olympic oh yeah it was like a double a side and I bought it on the strength of Cubic because it is you know very kind of ravey and like in your face and you know that kind of um aggressive sort of yeah. dance at the time whatever you want to call it but um yeah upon flipping it on the other side like olympic and i was just kind of like yeah this is so mellow and, and actually just a, a brilliant piece of music with mm -hmm. just an instr instrumental piece of music and just i just remember playing it about like 15 times in a row i just took it back to the beginning just like studying it like what are these guys doing this is absolutely fantastic and yeah, it was it was them and um, early Omnitrio really that that were the um, that the probably the genesis really for me to, for actually wanting to make my own music and uh, and get started in that. Nice, yeah. So 
Well, I'll just drop, I, I, you know, I guess in my mind before we started, I had an order of questions I wanted to ask, but I'm just going to let it flow. Um, I wanted yeah. to, I'll ask you about drum and bass because when I hear your drum and bass music, um, and again, I've been listening to this stuff as long as you have, and drum and bass is something that I feel it peaked in the 90s, just an opinion, but it kind of peaked in the 90s and it's sort of it's turned into, you know, different things and different factions. But what I hear with your music in particular, and I've mumbled about this on my own channel and my videos, you, mm. seem to be, you seem to be focused on recapturing that sound. And I, as someone who hears that, I, I have to ask, like, is that a conscious thing? Because when I hear your music, I'm hearing good looking records. I'm hearing moving shadow. I, I'm hearing, and I'm hearing that early one-off stuff like, um, do you know Lee and Tango? Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Okay. See, I figured you did. What well, I hope that's a compliment because when you're I, talking about you're talking about that Legend Records twelve. Yeah? Absolutely, so volume different. volume yeah. three. Yeah, yeah. I I'm still gutted actually. A quick story about that when I moved house. That was one of my records that somehow got lost in transit, and I can't afford to buy a copy these days because it's like two hundred dollars. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. It's it's very much. Um, a conscious decision it was like um so i guess going back to sort of the beginning like i had been with the with the drama bass scene like you know ever since its inception um mm -hmm. and totally loved like you know the atmospheric stuff or the intelligent stuff as it was early called and you know and the stuff on movie shadow good looking dj recordings etc cetera, etc cetera. you know that was absolutely just like massive and you know hearing Buckham for the first time and then like you know like hearing blame and you know people like that it was it was it was just a monumental moment it was that kind of sort of um the affirmation of like okay yeah this is exactly what i want to be doing you know the confirmation of like yeah this is this is this is who i am this is what i want to be you know that that type of thing you know this is where i want my productions to go that type right. of uh, that type of vibe but um but yeah, when I, it got to about about two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight or so, and I I just I'd lost touch with like drum and bass. I'd lost touch with what it meant to me. I think the music I was making at the time I wasn't happy with, um, and then I was I was ready to quit because I was quite content with just like writing techno and ambient and stuff on the side, and you know. Even though I hadn't done any sort of full length stuff by then, that was always like a, you know, a project in the forefront of my mind that I, I wanted to get to at some point soon. Mm -hmm. So, and then it was it was actually Debridge and Instrumental that approached me about the autonomic um, thing that happened, and that was kind of sort of a movement with like half time kind of drums. You know, things were more kind of eighty five BPM, very Mm -hmm. musical very kind of um 80s influence also just more for listening rather than mm -hmm. um club music but it still it still worked on the dance floor as well though you because you, you kind of had that slower thing happening with the dubstep anyway so you know sure. there was a lot of crossover even though it was you know wasn't the same tempo or anything like that you still had a mm -hmm. a similar kind of ethos in the dance with that but um after that finished i kind of like you know me and um sam kdc kind of took it upon ourselves to like create this thing called gray area which was um a way of mixing like the 170 it wasn't really drum and bass at that time it was just its own scene called like called 170 it was um I guess that's just the best way to explain it, really. But it was, it was, you know, kind of similar. It was like, you know, it was 170 tempo, but it didn't sound like drum and bass. And it was a lot of sort of triplet rhythms and just like very, very experimental kind of stuff. And and the gray area techno stuff we were doing was written in such a way that we kind of um, split up. Like, for instance, like if you divide 170 by four, it's 42.5. You times that by three and you get 127.5. So if you're writing a techno track at 127.5 in 3-4 time signature, it will mix with mm -hmm. the 174-4 track. Mm -hmm. 
mm. as long as it's like a rigid kind of sort of drum and bass beat, which which it wasn't at the time what we were doing. So so that was the focus of what we were doing for like the next um like four or five years really up until about 2019 and um obviously you know i had my ambient projects on the side as well but mm. going back to the drum and bass thing it was um just a a leisurely chat with uh with pressure who runs um samurai and um who was a big big help to me behind the scenes and helps me run my labels as well um we were just chatting and he was just saying, oh, do you remember this tune? And I was like, oh, yeah, you remember that tune? We were just t- talking about, you know, old Source Direct, old, like, oh, uh, yeah. J-Magic, Inner Vision stuff. Yeah. Um, the Source Direct stuff is fucking amazing, even to this day. Uh, yeah. It's it's next level. I mean, it's, Absolutely, it's, yeah. Yeah. The then Exercise probably... the Demons album, I mean, still blows me away. Yeah, it's fantastic, but I feel like the earlier stuff was even better. To yeah, be you're right. Um but um, yeah, it was. We were, we were just. Um, it was just, as I say, we were just like just an idle chat, just chatting about the the music and remembering the good old days and stuff like. That. And, and Jeff just said, "Have you ever thought about you know writing that stuff again?" And yeah. um, and I was like, "Oh no, that'd be that'd be stupid. No, yeah. no, it, you know that's it's all gone. There's, there's probably no point in doing that ever again. Um, <laughs> I think drummer bass has moved on, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera yeah and um and he just said well do some and just for the sake of it if you feel up to it and then you know we'll put it out and just see how it goes and and i said to him i was like okay well if i'm gonna do this it's gonna be exactly like the 1990s if i'm gonna be writing this as if i was trying to get on moving shadow or you know good looking or or any of those labels that i loved back then Love and i said you know i'm not going to be writing at the tempo of the current drama bass scene because i have nothing to do with it and i don't really care about it yeah sorry if that offends anyone but you know, <laughs> that's just 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 the way it is i'm you know i'm i'm 46 I'm, I'm too old for that kind of fast music now i just it doesn't vibe with me you know what mm-hmm. i mean it's, mm-hmm. yeah so so yeah um and I think like the first, I'm trying to think now, was it the first EP? Yeah, the first EP was the An, an, an Exact Science mm, we yeah. did we did on Samurai. And um, I, I couldn't believe the reception, to be honest. I mean, we actually ended up um, doing, I think, three represses on that. Wow. Like, so we sold out like immediately of like, I think we only did like, 400 just to just to test the waters mm. and it blew out and then and then we came, well, okay we'll do some more and then that that sold out and then we're like what's going on this yeah, is we're crazy on, we're on to something here yeah 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 pretty much and then i started you know we me, or me and jeff i mean jeff's got his like finger to the ground that's that's pressure by the way he's got his like you know his, his ear to the ground sorry not his finger um <laughs> so so yeah, he's he knows what's going on, and he was telling me about you know there's there's a bit of a kind of revival going on with the sort of jungle kind of sounds, yeah. and yeah. a lot of people try to do the nineties thing all over again with that. So I think that's probably why it worked, and the timing was good. And then um, off the back of that, he was like, "Well, do you want to keep doing this?" And I was having fun with it, and I was just like, "Okay, yeah, great, yeah, let's." Um, and he said, do you think you could do an LP? And I said, probably, yeah. I think, <laughs> I think, I've, got, I think I've got enough ideas and I'm enjoying it. So, yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah. And that's, that's how um, Isolated Systems came about. Oh, so uh, Love yeah. that album. Absolutely. I mean, you, you obviously probably already know this because I made a video on that. But that album in particular... Um, I'm so glad, by the way, to hear you say all that, because, yeah, I mean, when I was listening to this, it, just the, the the drum and bass music that you make in general now, I, it just takes me back. It's probably just a pure nostalgia thing, but um, mm. I'm happy that you're keeping your ethics that clear, because to me, it's like, yeah, I'm going to make this music that could have gotten me onto Moving Shadow, because that's exactly 
what it sounds like. And someone who's younger now who would listen to it, they might not necessarily even know those labels. So this is new to them, but you've, you're taking that sound and you're still presenting it in a 21st century way with the technology, I think. I feel that's almost kind of, you don't have much choice unless you are actually yeah. going back and like taking like for instance the software and programs from back then which would probably be like an early version of cubase on an atari st yeah an akai 950 or something you know something yeah. just it's a very very rudimentary setup with um and i think that's the only way you could kind of sort of make it sound that way but i feel like because of the advances in technology especially in like music production technology since like well the past sort of 20 30 years now thinking about mm -hmm. it it's it's night and day so mm -hmm. it, it, it's very very hard to make tracks deliberately sound kind of you know yeah yeah very basic and very you know well like they were written on that sort of equipment if you're not using that equipment so right yeah i mean you don't really you don't necessarily need any hardware at all anymore i mean it's you can stuff it all no. on the computer yeah. no i mean that's that's been the way for quite some time in mean, the the advances in like software and vsts like i mean it used to be like i remember there was a big thing in the early 2000s um big debate on like you know hardware versus software and it, it kind of had a point back then because people were saying you know vsts just sound really kind of over the top and cheesy and a bit too bright and a bit too just like it just didn't sound like the real thing but like you would be hard pushed these days to like tell the difference between like i don't know something um i try to think of a vst off the top of my head um Something like Omnisphere, which is like, you know, really good for atmospherics and like pads and stuff like that. It, you would be very, very hard pushed to tell the difference between that and say, I don't know, just looking around here, like a Korg Triton or something like that in, in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, because it's just come such a long way and you, you can really do everything in the box these days. Yeah. yeah. Like do you, do you, I mean, do you look to have that more tactile experience? Like, do you want to put your hand on a synthesizer or a drum machine, or do you are you okay with opening up your laptop and fully producing from there? Well, I mean, as you can probably see, I'm sat in yeah. my studio. And this is like, you know, pretty much like everything goes through um, my my desk here, and um, this is like my setup, and there's like synthesizers everywhere and stuff yeah. like that, but. But you know, I, I kind of, I kind of have an approach where it's it's like, if if a track needs it, then I will go with like sure. a synthesizer approach. Or you know, if I'm if I'm just messing around with a sample and manipulating it, and something comes out of that, then you know, I'll go with that approach. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any right or wrong way to do it, and mm -hmm. I think you know, if you're gonna be a bit of a snob and be like oh i'm only going to do you know i only use this i only use that then i feel like you're limiting yourself and it's yeah. Just yeah 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 so, you're not going to get to that point you need to get to if you're limiting yourself exactly yeah so I, I feel it's just it's a lot more healthy to just be open to the creative process in general and, and whatever works works you know mm -hmm. yeah the the song that really sticks out to me, and I'm sorry if I'm mangling the name of the song, but I think it's Thorn, a Rose Without a Thorn, or a Thorn, do you know the song? Yeah, Rose Without a Thorn. Rose Without a Thorn. That song, James, just oh. knocks me over. I, I, However you recorded it, um, that song just, that has intensely taken me back to the 90s. I mean, it's it sounds dirty. I hope that's not an insult, but it's... No, it's it was meant to, like, the break, uh, I think that's the tighten up break on that one. Um, Is it? Okay. Yeah, okay. and the, the recording I had of it wasn't the cleanest one. So, like, I ran it through, like, a couple of... I've got, like, um a Poltec clone, which is like a decent EQ um, by Clark Technic, which was it's not that expensive or anything like that, but it's really good for just sort of adding grit or, you know, adding like yeah. sort of transients and stuff like that and just like shaping, like it's really good for like shaping breaks basically. So mm -hmm. run it through and then, you know, just sort of smashed it through a couple of compressors as well to get that real sort of, you know, 
kind of sort of heavy hitting. Yeah, dude. Of, and then and then you know everything goes through the desk anyway, so you get that um, the the lovely EQ that it provides. So um, so yeah, it was it was just. I think the whole album really is just just experimenting with breaks and sounds and just like um, it's very inspired by Source Direct, Dom and Roland, um, yeah. Protec, um, yeah. Chain Magic. Probably, probably those those pro, those four guys probably the most I would say. Yeah, I mean, I would I I would thank you for that album because as someone who loves Fotec and Source Direct, um, it was. You know, it's of course it's about the drum and the bass, but it's it, the detail shows in that album. It's about the notes in between, like Thorn uh, Rose Without a Thorn, for example. When you when you get rid of the bass, that that break part, when you just you, when it's um, I mean, for as much as that song has a break and there's no bass, it's when the bass kicks in again. It's just it's the most exciting kind of music that I can hear. So uh, thank you because yeah, as someone who loves those kinds of bands and in my opinion, no one's really ever done it better than those guys other than you, of course, now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can totally. It, I, don't, I don't know if I would say that myself, but that's a nice compliment for sure. So thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're carrying the torch, if nothing else. I mean, because um, um, yeah, Fotec and Source Direct to me, I mean, they're at the top of the heap. So um, yeah. In terms of in terms of the other styles of music you make, which is ambient, which you're also excellent at, do you have to? Um, I'm sorry if this is a rudimentary question. If you've been asked this a million times, but do you have to be in a certain headspace to do ambient and then drum and bass, or do you have different pans in the fire at any given time? Can you work on an ambient piece and then work on a drum and bass piece and then do more straight ahead techno music or work on your comet? stuff which by the way i'd like to talk about that at some point but are you able to you know you know uh, mo emotionally or just intellectually kind of have your hands in all those fires at once most of the time yeah i, I feel like it's i feel more it comes from like just having this sort of burning desire to create like um, i'm just it's that's 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 what motivates me the most just the actual sort of process of creation is that is what i'm just driven by really so you know I, if i ever sort of get a bit you know burnt out on dmb or techno or whatever i can just switch to you know something else that i'm that i'm into you know like the comic stuff like the ambient stuff like you know techno or dm just switch between them but there's um a lot of times i i have quite a lot of projects on the go in in many different styles anyway so it, it's it's very easy to um to switch back and forth but there are times though when like you know um especially like with my um my label spatial which um mm. which I'm doing at the moment which is like all the atmospheric yeah. dmp stuff from the 90s mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of excitement about that and like when i'm writing that stuff it's it's hard to set it aside and say okay right i need to write on this because i'm I'm just very much like sort of getting carried away with like the excitement myself of, of writing that stuff so um sure yeah some, some, sometimes it's a challenge yeah but like i would say most of the time I'm, I'm able to just say okay right i'm doing these projects this is the plan i want to do this and then i can yeah. you know just on any given day, just be like, okay, I'm going to write some techno today. And you're so beautifully prolific. I mean, um, and I mentioned this, I know, in a video on my channel, but most of the times artists, in my opinion, when they're prolific, that means that at least 50% of their product or music is not going to sound up to snuff. And that's fine. In fact, I think it's a little unhealthy to just flatly love everything an artist does. But you're prolific and you're good. It's like everything you put out has a very high quality to it. And, um, um, you know, obviously I was going to ask you if, um, you have any, any, uh, time that you set aside for doing different genres of music, but you clearly don't. I think you just answered that. Like, if you feel like mm -hmm. you, can, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's nice of you to say that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, like I, I said, you have to get in a certain headspace to do it. 
Yeah, I mean, it definitely helps. I, I think um, I think Ambient's a good um, example of that. Like, I think I work best when, if I say to myself, okay, I, I really want to write an Ambient album, then usually I'm going to be on that start to finish. No, there's going to be no interruptions. I'm not going to get like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to write some DMB today. I'm going to write some techno. I'm going to write yeah. some idm or whatever you know it's it's usually like i want to see this project through from start to finish and and sure. that's usually how it goes with um with the ambient stuff but um yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's uh, fur and dream is one of my favorite albums from yours i love that album I, that reminds right. me too like you use asc as i mean you use different names and i'll let people go investigate all of those um i just mentioned mm -hmm. comet but I, you know, it's, it's common in the electronic world. Like if you make an ambient album, like we'll like take Tom Middleton and Mark Pritchard, for example, if they, if they were ambient, they would generally do global communication. And if they wanted to do electro, they do Jedi Knights. And, um, but mm. you use AI ASC, which is, I, I, I like that. It's like, well, this is where I am right now. I made drum and bass then, and now I'm doing ambient. And, um, if that, if that fucks yeah. expectations then too bad. I feel like it was almost a happy accident how that happened because I was toying with like a bunch of um, different aliases at, at one point. Um, I mean, I started doing like some ambient dub techno under the name Mindspan early mm. on. That was like mm. 2004, I think I did the first album. Yeah. Um, and then there was a lot of IDM under, under the name Intex Systems. Yeah, um, which I kind of stopped doing, but it, it all came to like this point where I was just like, "Do I really need all these aliases?" Yeah, probably, probably not. And yeah. I think I was the the fact that you know I'd, I'd done a lot of um, techno and, and and started DJing all over the world, pretty much playing that sort of stuff. That people just kind of accepted me as like an electronic artist first mm -hmm. and foremost and um yeah that that worked to my advantage and and in the end i just kind of other than the comment thing i kind of pushed everything to to the side and just started um using asc and yeah well i like that too i i like the idea that when i pick up an asc record i'm not necessarily going to know what it is i i, I appreciate that um and mm -hmm. comet i did want to bring up comet too if those of you who don't know comet um, you've put out a couple of records on Strangely Isolated Place. Um, I, I've talked to him before, actually. I, I used to work at Discogs. I don't know if you've um, heard that in my... Yeah. 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 Um, he, I interviewed him at some point, and he's a, he's a nice guy. He, the, the music that comes from that label is excellent. But your music, again, I, not to keep comparing, but um, it reminds me a little bit of that general production recordings era. Do you know what I'm talking about? In the 90s? Uh -huh. Like um, Luke Slater's seventh, um, oh, what was it? Seventh plane, seventh planet, or something? Was it? What's that? Was it seventh planet? Uh, seventh seventh plane. Uh, plane. Yeah, and then um, Germ. Do you remember Germ? Um, uh, no. And Black Dog, even. Uh, of, of course, Black Dog. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, just just to jump on that. Yeah, the whole kind of idea was that was. Um, do you remember the? Um, Compilations Warp put out. Artificial um, Intelligence. Yes. I yeah. One of, yeah. Um, yeah. That was, again, one of those um, sort of chance buys. I was, again, in just HMV and saw these two CDs yeah. there and um, looked at the back and it was just like, oh, okay, I, I kind of know Warp a little bit. I like some more tech of stuff. Um, yeah. You know, FX Twin, obviously. Yeah, great. So um, picked those two up and Again, it was like one of those eureka moments, like something just yeah. flicked on inside me. I was just like, "What? Okay, this is unfucking real. What is this music?" Just, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. But um, yeah, that would be a big influence. But um, I think my my biggest influence is uh, a friend of mine, actually, Ulrich Schnauss. Oh yeah, I was going to ask you about that actually because you yeah. made a record with him. Yeah, well, like we did a. Uh, an EP together on auxiliary and um, yeah, I, remi yeah. I did a remix uh, of uh, a track of his, which came out on uh, Domino, I think it was. Yeah. 
um for, for the stateside release anyway and um yeah yeah just hearing his his early stuff like um far away trains and um a strangely isolated place which yeah. obviously where ryan got the name for yeah. the album from so um massive massive influence um well, his Which early stuff was drum and bass too. Have you heard the seven? Yeah, yeah, Ethereal seventy seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ulrich was doing drum and bass long before he became known. Yep, yep. Um, he's in Tangerine Dream now, isn't he? Isn't he part of the band? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Wow, crazy. Yeah, he's, he's an absolute fantastic musician, but not only that, just one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Just nice, super down to earth, most humble guy, and. He's just full of advice and help, and he's just, I can't praise him enough. He's he seems guy. that way. He's, he seems yeah. that way. As someone who's never met him, he seems that way. But um, sorry to cut yeah. you off. Back to, to, no, back to cool. your own record. Like, how did how did you guys connect on that? Um, so, I had, so he, he emailed me out of the blue one day. Um, we'd never spoke, and he said, do you have any of your, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Do you have any of your old records on Cover Operations, which was the first label mm -hmm. I did? Mm -hmm. And I said, I was just like, oh, it's now is emailing me. <laughs> My, I was like, okay, that's that's pretty cool. But then obviously, yeah, I, you know, I realized I was like, oh, yeah, of course, he used to be in the drum and bass. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I um, said, yeah, I've got a pile of stuff here like um just tell me what you want and i'll be happy to just send you it no no problem and yeah we just got talking after that and um it wasn't until like the auxiliary days which was probably i think i think that started in 2010 mm -hmm. i think yeah i think that's about right uh, that's and it wasn't until, wasn't until then that um we were just we were, we were chatting and said, yeah, what, what do you reckon about do, doing a collaboration? And we were just, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And uh, it was originally going to be an LP, but um, we wow. just didn't have, we didn't have the time. It yeah. was, um, I think there was just so much going on with him at the moment, at the time. Um, he was like finishing up an LP and I think he was starting to tour with Tangerine Dream at the time. And um I mean, he was is massively in demand as a remixer anyway. So yeah. he was always, always busy and doing just amazing stuff. So um, yeah, unfortunately, we didn't get to like do any more than that EP. But mm. it's always one of those things we've always talked about. Like you know, we'd like to do something again in the future. So you know, it, it might happen. We'll see. God, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, it's hard to overstate what Far Away Trains did to the scene. Uh, at the time. Yeah, it was yeah. huge. And for him to, I remember I, I had the Seven Seal album and Ethereal 77, of course. And and then I heard Far Away Trains. I was like, is this the same? Ulrich Schnauss is a pretty unique name. How many Ulrich Schnauss are there? Yeah. But, you know, that just proves how talented the guy is. I was like, wow, this is completely, this is not what I was expecting at all. Um, and then, of course, the album that came after that, which the label is named after. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, if anyone hasn't heard that record with James here, you should because I, 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 you know, I can't imagine many people that watch my channel are not Ulrich Schnauss fans at the very least. Um, yeah, it's called Seventy Seven EP because yeah, obviously it's... we're both born in nineteen seventy seven, and nice simple um, tie in. But yeah, it's um, four slices of kind of kind of autonomic kind of halftime thing, but very um, synth oriented and. Um, it's just very, very musical and very deep, as yeah. you probably yeah. would expect, you know? Yeah, no, it's a beautiful record. Um, I would have loved to hear a full album, but hey, maybe that'll happen sometime, you know? Uh, <laughs> you never speaking know. of your labels, too, I see you have a spatial in the background there on the wall. Um, oh, I yeah. It's that's like spatial, that. right? Is that what I'm seeing there? The things up top. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those were some printed in inserts that we gave away with... Um, some records that we did oh, so nice. i decided so to get them framed for the studio yeah it looks good i was going to ask you about labels too like obviously you have your own labels and um what i like about your label and i i wanted to see if you felt the same way is that you only have a couple of artists your own stuff 
and then you have oral imbalance, of course. Um, but I'm wondering if that's important to you, like to, rather than have a label where you just put out stuff, always putting out as much stuff as you can. Is it more important for you to have a smaller cater of artists that might subscribe to the same? Hundred percent. Yeah. Vision? It's, yeah. It's, for me, it's like um, it might be seen as elitist to some, but I've I've have this very very high like. Um, quality control levels and um so far the only artists other than myself on the label uh oral imbalance uh jamie myerson under his jlm productions name yeah, yeah. and uh and eusebia so i've mm -hmm. it's op i mean it's one of those things it's open like I, I don't have it closed off to like you know there's never going to be any other artists on there but i i have to be wowed in in such a way that i'm yeah. thinking Okay, this artist is bringing something that the, the you know the core artists that we already have don't bring to the label. So, right. and I don't want to just sign someone just for the sake of you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for me, it's, it's, or something. right? And, and for me, it's it's more about like creating um, a family that will sort of you know a mm -hmm. tight knit group that will all all on the same wavelength and. Um, they're all working together for the same sort of um, mm -hmm. greater good to, to serve, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm not at all suggesting that you would agree with this, but that's something that I I dearly miss about about Warp. Like I feel like in the early mm -hmm. days they had a small group of people that really shared the same ethic, you know, and the same vision. It was LFO and it was Nightmares on Wax and then Aphex came and Autechre. It was like a hand. When something came out on Warp, you knew it was going to be of obscenely high quality. Now, yeah. I don't really know. I don't know what the the face of the label is anymore. I don't really know what the identity is anymore. And that's what I appreciate about your label. I feel like that's probably just because they got so so big and it's more of a commercial entity now than it is an actual yeah. record label. Like, you know, they dabble in films and, you know, that type of thing. And um so I, I guess that's probably why it happens. But yeah, I mean I I think even if that did happen to to us and, you know, we started magically scoring films or whatever, you know, it was it's <laughs> like yeah. I don't think that would change because just of my sort of ideology of how I want to run a label and how I feel like the music should be presented to people. Yeah. Yeah. I think a, a current label that does it really well, in my opinion, is Giggling. Do you know Giggling based out of Germany? I know uh, the name, but I, I'm absolutely terrible at like following music these days. Cause I'm just like, I don't have hardly any time to listen to music. So I'm just creating all the time. You're making it's, it. Yeah. Hey, better to make it than, and listen and you make a lot. I, have, I have heard the name giggling yet they, I, just, I, just can't, I just can't put my mind to like anything on the label that's all their bigger names recently have been like traum prince and dj metatron and i don't know okay. if this stuff um they do they have that um kind of mysteriousness to them they don't do any interviews you know i kind of miss those days where these indie labels would come up and you didn't know a goddamn thing about it. You know, you just bought the records and that's all you really cared yeah. about. You know, um, it's, it's fun because in the, in the age of technology that we have now, it's impossible really to be mysterious about, and you know, yeah. this very interview is guilty of that. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> everyone is so accessible. Can we, can we cancel it? <laughs> yeah, let's no, do man. this. <laughs> this is just going to be for our enjoyment here. Um, speaking yeah. of like soundtrack stuff, like have you ever been approached for stuff like that? Your music, especially. Yeah, I've done, I've done um, a bunch of indie films. Um, I've scored stuff for TV. Um, uh, done video games. Uh, Whoa! It was all, it was all kind of going in that direction up until COVID, and then it's just been a bit barren after that. So, but do yeah, it started, I, do you mind if I ask you which video game you've? scored yeah it's a uh, it was an indie game on steam called near death near death okay so it's it's like an fps game where you're not fighting against any enemies the enemy is like the elements of the weather because you try to survive in um subarctic conditions and like wait to get rescued as your plane crashed on there oh wow well i'm playing this i'm gonna be picking this up for sure yeah and um 
that that was that was a fantastic experience actually like it was they, they sent me um like a rough build of the game and originally they were just they were saying you know we'd like to license this track from this album this track from and they picked a bunch out like from like from my early stuff like time heals all um mm -hmm. truth be told uh i think there was something from fervent dream on there as well mm -hmm. and then i said to them what if i just scored it yeah from, from scratch would you be up for that do you have the budget for it and they were like oh fuck yeah let's do it mm -hmm. and i was just i was like brilliant yeah, yeah let's do it. And then, like the first, I, I remember just being so excited. Like after I'd finished it, and like uh, they sent across the build, and just like that excitement of like playing a game and and like hearing your own music as well, oh, yeah. and like how it all dynamically shifted in the areas and stuff you were going into. It was just a very very satisfying moment. Yeah. Are you a gamer yourself? Yeah, but yeah, I, I am too. Me too. Yeah. Um, That's why I was excited to hear you say this. I need to go play this now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a massive source of inspiration, especially like sci-fi stuff and um, oh yeah, psychological horror stuff like Silent Hill and stuff. That's... Oh, I'm I'm with you. Did you um? We'll get into a gaming conversation here. Um, did you play <laughs> Cyberpunk? Did you have any chance? Yeah, to get into this? loved it. I'm I actually going. Through, I'm actually, actually going through Phantom Liberty at the moment. I just finished it. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking brilliant. Fucking brilliant. Um, yeah, I'm loving every second so far. The, the acting the acting in video games, I mean, voice acting, whatever, it's acting. People want to say voice acting. It's acting. Um, mm. the, the, the acting in video games, I think, is far superior to the vast majority of what I see on TV, at least, and even better than a lot of mm. stuff I see in movies. I have to agree, and like especially when you use like Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven as an example with like you know Keanu Reeves and Idris oh. Elba and Elba was just, amazing. Oh, he's like he is just like he made me fall in love with the game all over again. Me too. It's, it's just it it the immersion and just how it sucks you in is, yeah. is just something else. And the, the amount of detail in Cyberpunk is it, it, it blows my mind, it's especially as I was playing through Phantom Liberty, which I think I don't know how you feel, but I thought it was better than the core game. Um, it's probably either Salva that made that made it that way. But the detail, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you had moments where you would just get lost in the city. I'd just be wandering around. I'd wander down an, an alley. And um, it doesn't surprise me that you like this because you sound like a man of detail um, as mm -hmm. I am. In the game, I mean, the, the amount of detail just in the piles of garbage and rubbish on the streets, it's like, my God, how yeah. long, how many people would have to be involved in creating this experience? I mean, it's so impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that kind of thing, and it's it's like an element that I always try and add to my music. It's like I love to see reviews where people are saying, "I hit, I heard so much extra on the second time around," and then like you know, every time I listen to it, I'm hearing new elements and like stuff like that. That because that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to create like these little microcosms of sound and like these little yeah like, pockets of like space of like just yeah. for to happen in in the background and just like just get absorbed in do you know do you know what i mean absolutely that's why i love your music james is because it's it's music of detail it's music you know you can listen to it on a surface level i mean that's fine if you want to pump it in your car that's mm. totally acceptable but um you know it's like you can listen to it 20 times and you're like oh shit, i i never heard that before and <laughs> Yeah, that's what I love about your music. You can tell that you pour over every second of it, as you should, you know. Um, it, so it doesn't surprise me that you're a gamer because, yeah, those are, I don't know, man. When it comes to video games, I see a lot more inspiration happening in them than I see in a lot of movies. Again, just an opinion, but I don't know how you feel about that. Um, I go through phases. Like, um, yeah. like I, I will just go through phases of just, like, watching movie after movie and, like, I won't be in the mood for playing any games for a bit or or vice versa or I'll get sucked into a show or something like that. And um Yeah. But yeah, it's it's uh yeah, video games are just uh, they're an art form these days. Absolutely. I, mean, I always felt that from the from the early days. It's the type of stuff I like anyway, because I was yeah. like for instance, um my favorite game of all time is Super Metroid. Oh my god. Oh yeah. 
Beautiful. And I just remember like the, the time, like the first time I played the game, and I must have been about fourteen or fifteen or something like that, and I had I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and I just went in, went in totally blind and just got absolutely absorbed in it and and yeah. ended up getting lost and just that feeling of isolation and, and mm. dread just like yeah. what's around the next corner like further you go down deeper and like to like sort of you know the mm -hmm. hotter is in the game and it's it's just it's just magical storytelling that like you always you're almost kind of using your own imagination to fill in what they couldn't do with the technology at the time you know yeah I mean? exactly yeah, yeah. It's, it's, to, to this day and that's always what i loved about gaming it's a very intensely individual experience like with, with, with multiplayer i've never understood the the allure of that i mean i get why people want to do it but i've never been that way it's like i want to hunker down and get totally absorbed in this experience alone you know i, I used to i used to do the multiplayer thing a bit i mean i was like heavily into counter-strike for a bit oh like, right. Yeah, like I actually played on a sort of amateur level. <laughs> yeah, bit, which well, that's a... the, that's the other thing about playing online is I get my ass handed to me. It's like yeah, I yeah, you, twelve year olds. And... I couldn't do it these days because you've got to be on it like every single day practicing and you know making sure your aim is just like smooth and like so you can click to heads instantly. But yeah, I just I just don't have the the time to do to be. Um, Putting into that, I'd rather spend it on music. So yeah, I hear you. Yeah, one more game question. Um, have you played Starfield? Speaking of sci-fi, no, I was put off by the reviews simply because Bethesda and like how glitchy their games are, and a lot of people said they felt very empty and uh, like the planets were very samey, and it got a bit repetitive in that aspect. Kind of like uh, I don't know if you played No Man's Sky at all. I did. Yeah. Like after a while, each yeah. after a while, each procedurally generated planet becomes essentially yeah. the same thing, and mm. that's kind of the. I think there's obviously a lot more to Starfield than there is than No Man's Sky, but um, yeah, I haven't got around to it yet. It's it's not something I've I've ruled out playing because I, I probably will do at some point, as I loved um, Fallout Three. Yeah. Like that that was one of the first ones from Bethesda that really. Uh, Oh yeah, like yeah, it was another immersion thing. Just I think I spent about two hundred odd hours on that game. <laughs> I, I I'm sure I did. Well, I will say that Starfield, I loved it. Um, I will say as a as a promotional point, as they made, as Todd Howard made about the procedural procedurally generated pl planets, that was disappointing. I mean, it was yeah, you can go to countless planets, but if it's the same thing over and over. It does get a little boring, but there's enough meat on the bone story wise. Yeah. I, I would recommend it. I also understand like the limitations that come with that, though, because like if you're procedurally generating stuff, then you've only got a certain set of parameters that are, only, are going to be adjusted for each thing. So it cannot be that you would have like like a essentially unlimited amount of planets out there, and they're all going to be completely different and unique and different bio, you know, biomes, etc. It's it's a very hard thing to pull off so yeah 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 it was... you, can't, you can't be too like you know let down by that aspect i guess yeah in the previous game you mentioned too that those procedurally generated planets i couldn't play that game it was um it just seemed it just seemed to get really old hat very quickly you know it was uh mm -hmm. i i couldn't do it but yeah i would recommend star i starfield but cyberpunk i'm glad you played that because yeah um I mean anything by CD, CD Project Red, really. I love the Witcher series as well. So um, I'm still going to play that. It's one of those games I've had on my Steam library for about four or five years, and just haven't got around to playing it yet. Oh my god, James Witcher three will yeah. blow your fucking mind. I, they're they're re upping the the first two games too. I guess they're doing remasters of those. So no. maybe you want to wait and play it in chronological order. I don't know if that matters because I never really played through the first two. But Witcher yeah. three. Yeah. amazing it's some of the most amazing shit i've ever played um i don't know if i'm keeping you too long here i'm really enjoying this conversation it's all good i've not yeah. got anything else planned so i wanted to uh i wanted to ask you about um vinyl like a lot of people who watch my channel the, the people who are asleep from our video game conversation you can wake <laughs> up now 
uh, I'm assuming hopefully that doesn't happen, but um, I could talk about games all day. But um, when it comes to vinyl, is it essential for you to put your stuff out on wax? Because your stuff's on Apple Music, and you're really quick to get it on there, and thank you for that. But I buy records like anybody. I, I find myself weaning away from it a little bit because if it's such high quality on the digital platforms, I think, why have any more records? But then it's like, well, having that physical copy is important. So I'm wondering, is it important that Spatial and Auxiliary get those pieces of vinyl yeah. in people's hands? Yeah. 100%. Because, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very old school way of looking at things. But like as a producer, I want something to show for my hard work i don't want a file on a computer sure that that to me doesn't like seem like you've released something it's just like you've just pressed a button and now people can hear it which is which is great and it's you know that's the way of the world these days but like i i still get that immense satisfaction and pride of having mm -hmm. my music on vinyl and like as an as an avid collector myself you know it, it's it's just I think it's the ultimate reward pretty much cool so you are so you you're a record collector then for sure yeah, yeah. nice yeah i've got thousands i mean i'm trying to thin out the herd because i i used to be in various dj pools in the 90s and i i'll find a box of the same record over and over so i'm kind of thin, trying to thin that out in fact i don't know i don't know if you'd be interested but i think i might have two copies of lee and tango i'd be happy to look for you um, if, if you do, I would I would happily pay whatever you want. As well, I didn't know it was going for. Did you say two hundred pounds? It's going for. It's around two hundred dollars or something. The last time I checked, and I, oh, yeah, I no. I have like a rule like that I will not pay over like forty dollars for a piece of record. Yeah, you shouldn't have to. I just don't yeah. see the value in it. To be honest, I mean, as much as I would love to have it again, because I had that record, and it's I think that's the thing that kind of hurts the most is parting with money for something I already had, but somehow it got misplaced or something yeah. like that. that. Yeah. That kind of feels like almost paying insurance money, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, if you pay car insurance every year for years or every month for years and you never get in an accident, shouldn't I get a refund of some sort? But um, yeah. It's, yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but um yeah, with uh with with records i kind of find myself you get I, in my case i have so many it's um i find myself weaning off of it a little bit but there are certain types of records that i have to have vinyl on like drum and bass i can't imagine not having a physical co physical copy of that i don't know if it's this pure nostalgia effect in effect there you know what i mean i think that comes into it um because i think the other thing as well is a lot of that 90s stuff still hasn't made it to digital platforms no it should so, but... a bunch of these little kind of obscure labels that may have put out like you know nine or ten amazing records and then just folded and yeah and these people have then probably just gone on to mm -hmm. have families or a different career or whatever and just forgotten about it and, and you know the people that want the digital copies are just left wanting and the only way you can get it is get the vinyl and ripping it yourself yeah, like I think Good Looking Records is one that I haven't seen. Have you? Do they have a digital? Like I don't think I've seen anything digital. Much. I mean, maybe very. They little. did for a while. They had like a selection of stuff, not everything, but a selection of stuff on band, uh, not Bandcamp, uh, uh, Beatport. Oh, okay. Um, and Great. I try not to use Beatport because I just think it's a complete and utter scam. Like the fact that they will charge more than everyone else and then for instance you can't you i don't know if it's the same but it, for instance if you bought an mp3 of something and then you wanted to go back and download it in WAV format then you'd have to pay an extra for extra yeah. fee. and like bandcamp you can just choose whatever you want and it's just a flat fee of whatever the artist decides right what is the so, gain there i've wondered this do you know why why would they do this i don't know and they've also put like um time limits now on stuff yeah like if, if like it's been six months or something then you have to rebuy it right if, to re-download it again so i just tend to like try not to use them at all i just think it's a scummy business practice and not something that i want to support absolutely i used to buy stuff from bport all the time I, I won't use them anymore i mean i don't know why anyone wouldn't use bandcamp honestly i mean 
yeah it goes right to you guys it goes right to the artists um i will mm -hmm. say that every time like by the way james just released some new stuff this week i got a message from Bandcamp this week <laughs> Um, I'm fucking late. Every time I get an email about your records, it's like, these are, these are available. And by the, it's like, it seems like I get the email that day and they're gone. They're already gone. It's like your, your shit sells quick, at least on Bandcamp. Yeah. I'm, I'm, we're fortunate at the moment. Like, you know, like I said, with the whole spatial thing and like, um, I think I might, I might not be wrong in saying we are the only label that is doing purely 90s sounding atmospheric drum and bass. Yeah, so, absolutely. yeah. So, well, on vinyl at least, anyway. Um, mm. So, yeah, I feel like anyone that's into that sound um, is is loving it and, and buying it up straight away. So that's mm. that's probably a, a really it's a, it's a blessing for us, anyway. That's that's for sure right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you decide, maybe I'm getting too far into the weeds here, but how do you decide how many copies of a 12 inch to make? Like if you want to do 400. It just goes off of like what the previous ones sold and like what distribution is asking for. Like, cause like we try to do, um, well, we do like a hundred special editions, which are like usually like some crazy over the top, um, color. Have you seen some of those ones? Oh, I have some. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. 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 So, um, so yeah, we we do those for direct orders on Bandcamp. So mm -hmm. that's the only way you can get that specific vinyl from, and then the 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 normal vinyl run goes to the distributor after we've sold our however many allocation via pre order. Okay. And, um, usually, it's the distributor who would come back and say, "Okay, well, we have still got like sixty orders for this one, so could you know." Could you like press like a, do a repress of like an extra hundred or, you know, the mm -hmm. next time instead of doing like, you know, six hundred, we'll do seven hundred. Mm -hmm. uh, been a couple of ones where we've actually had to do like about eight or nine hundred copies, which is kind of crazy in this day and age because, like, I guess the average twelve these days sells probably about three hundred copies. That's about it. Yeah, that was that what I was getting to. to. That yeah. seems to be. Um, like the the sort of the average for like what you would expect a 12 inch to sell without any kind of hype or whatever but um yeah i'm I'm very grateful that um that people are uh you know putting the money forward and, and really supporting this and and it's it's turned into something really really special so yeah yeah, it seems like you you must have a really good relationship with Juno to some extent too, right? Because your your shit seems to pop up really quickly on Juno, and that's generally where I buy the vast majority. And it's been that way for years. I can't imagine. I feel like my second home is Juno. You know, I've spent more time on this website probably than any other. Especially living over here, because like they give the best postage rates, don't they? So. Yeah. And it's not bad here to the States. I mean, if you want just regular mail, I think it's usually $12 or something. I mean, that's not terrible. Um, yeah, we can't, that's the thing. We can't compete with that on Bandcamp because like everything's sent out via us directly. So we have to go by whatever Royal Mail or DHL are, are charging, you know, so. Is, uh, is your distributor in California there with you or is it somewhere no, else? No, no, no. Everything's done in Europe. Oh, so, okay. okay. So, um, yeah, Jeff uh, Pressure handles that side of uh, the logistics of the labels for me, fortunately. So, um, yeah, I would be completely lost without him, to be honest. So, <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, you need all the time you can get to make your music. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, that's that's it. I just want to be creating. I don't want to be bogged down with the business side of things. So having a really business-minded person, like, running that kind of – that side of the, the label and the business is, is absolutely fantastic and, like, a total gift for me really because i can yeah, then awesome. put everything into the design and the, um, the music yeah yeah is it um when it comes to recording music is it is it a compulsion for you I hope, if you don't mind telling me like do you do you have a set amount like is it like a not to, not to completely sterilize the idea but do you have a set amount of hours do you want you want to record every day or are you are you just compelled like i I didn't plan on being here 14 hours today, but this is what happened. <laughs> it's a bit of both. Yeah. It's a bit of both. Like, usually I would get up and, like, my first thing would be, like, 
um, get some exercise. I'll probably go to the gym like three or four times a week. And then um, also I, I like to just go out and walk just to sort of clear my head. And, you know, sometimes without it, even having music on just to go walk three or four miles and just, um, mm -hmm. you know, just get that sort of uh, endorphins going in your body and just, you know, it's good for the mental health, obviously, as well. Yeah. So yeah. I, I like to do that and then I'll come back and then there's there's days where I'll just like I'll start an idea and then I'll just I just be like okay I feel like I've hit a brick wall perhaps start something else uh and then perhaps that one turns into something big or you know you know it turns into a, an, an album sure. or yeah it, it you just don't know until like you're actually in the process of it but Mm -hmm. going back to what you just said the word you used originally was like compulsion it, it's definitely that yeah it's like i i've always had this um it's like this just sort of burning sort of desire inside me to create just and and like before music it was like um it was drawing i was just i was really into like freehand drawing and um i would i'd do a lot of that in my early themes before I um, started to learn how to make music and um, cool. uh, but yeah it's it's just it can be it's a curse though at the same time because I feel like I've had like sleep problems my whole adult life because my mind just will not switch off because I'm just constantly thinking about ideas and like like I, it's funny like the other, the other night I was laying in bed trying to get to sleep and I got this idea for a track and I was like, well, yeah, okay, if I built this, uh, you know, and I was, you know, I'm started planning it out in my head already as I'm yeah. trying to go to sleep. And it's just like, Jesus, shut the fuck up. Yeah, no. up. as but a writer, I woke, yeah, I get that. Yeah. But I woke up the next day and um, actually realized that idea I had and put it down and, and actually finished the track I'm talking about like last night. So, I, I, do you ever do you ever have thoughts like going back to the early '90s? Had you never started DJing, you might not ever have found this outlet. I mean, maybe it would have manifested itself in some other way, but it just seems you, you in yeah. my opinion, you were clearly put on this earth to make beats, man, and make music because you're uh, you're fucking amazing at it. But do you ever have those thoughts like, well, what the hell else would I be doing right now if I didn't have this? Kind of, yeah. When when I was um, about 15, 16, I was really good at football, um, soccer to you guys, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I was playing for a bunch of teams. Um, and then I went to university, to Huddersfield University, and I was playing for the, for the uni team. And mm. I actually had trials lined up to go to to like try out for Huddersfield Town, who were wow. a who were a I think at the time they were only like a second or third division team. They hadn't made it into the Premier League or anything big at the time. They did have one one or two seasons. I think that was about ten years ago, something like that. Well second but, tier I mean second tier it's not bad. Yeah. And so yeah, what happened I was coming home from training for my uh, Sunday league team and I used to, it was like the next village along and I used to just pretty much walk home. It only took like an hour. So I took a shortcut that night, jumped over a wall, landed on a pile of bricks and my left ankle just snapped. <laughs> oh, Jesus. So it ended and, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I remember going to the hospital. It was funny. I was lying there, like screaming until like someone walked past and, and, because I couldn't get up, I couldn't move or anything. And then um, I told them, you know, my uh, parents' number to call them. And yeah, my mom came, picked me up and took me to the, the hospital. Um, I remember asking the doctor, I was like, how long is it going to take to to heal? Um, and he said, bad news is you're probably going to have arthritis and mm -hmm. um, you're going to be in traction and a cast for probably about three months yeah. and yeah i don't think you're going to be able to play football <laughs> yeah. which totally and utterly just broke my heart and i was um i think that just changed my um 
but it just changed everything. It changed my body composition at the time. I, sure. I was no longer athletic or anything like that. I uh, started uh, putting weight on back then. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the time, I was just like, well, okay, I'm just putting everything I've got into music then, I think. Yeah. I'm, yeah. You know, this, this is also something I love just as much. And perhaps it's time to just completely focus on on writing music and um, – and trying to get somewhere with it. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I guess it, perhaps it all happens for a reason. I, I don't know if I 100% believe in sort of destiny or fate or whatever. Yeah. Kismet or whatever, you know. Yeah. It's interesting but, to hear you say that. I had an interest. In, I, I, I played American football and I thought I was going that way. And I tore my ACL. I was just, you know, like you said, I was splayed out on the ground and writhing in pain and, you know, you're just kind of forced. You're forced to figure something else out. It's not like you have a choice. It's like, oh shit, okay, well, you know, let's see what comes yeah. down. The line. But that's what. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, it was fortunate, you know, fortunate that I was like really heavily into music at the at the same time as well. And you know, I was always always DJing and like dabbling with like the the early sort of programs on the Atari ST and um, yeah, trying try and make tracks and like work out how it was done etc so mm -hmm. i had that kind of that background and it was um yeah i actually just i dropped out of university like about three or four months later i think and just said to my parents right i'm gonna get a job um gonna put my money into getting a studio together and mm -hmm. that's it i'm gonna do it and obviously at the time they were like not happiest <laughs> yeah yeah you're gonna do <laughs> what yeah why are you throwing this away you know you, you've got a you might have a career at the end of this in graphic design because that's what i was at university for oh okay um but i mean that that also worked out because you know i do all the design for my yeah. release everything so that's that's it, it came in handy as well i yeah. guess but um but yeah at the time it was they weren't they weren't happy at all they were i know they were just like, this is, a, you know, you're wasting your life. You're not going to be making any money. You're not going to have financial security or stability. To, right. Everything else comes with it. And I said so, I understood. But ultimately, I have to be doing something that I absolutely love. Otherwise, it's just, it's not worth doing. You know what I mean? I just don't yeah. want to be stuck in a nine to five doing a, a dead end job and then just getting pissed on the weekends or whatever, like my mates were doing. It was yeah. just, I, I wanted more from life, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to be alive, are you going to spend the, the precious seconds you have doing that? Like, I mean, you, you're forced to create your own way forward, I think, you know? Yeah. And that's what you did. I, are you a Brian Eno fan at all? Oh, big time. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I assumed you were like, I, I can't help but think of that the, his term oblique strategies, the way you were talking about um, how you record. You know, you're I assume maybe you have a lot of unfinished, unreleased music, because if you start something and you don't know what to do with it, you set it aside, you start something else. And then a year later, you're working on something and you're like, oh, shit, what about that thing I did a year ago? I, do you employ that kind of stuff? Like, do you take? Yeah, sometimes of, yeah. I'll usually try and see a track through to the end though just because if anything i see it as practice because i feel like in the art of like writing a song like if you just sort of get like i don't know 16 to 64 bars done or something and then that's it you just you scrap that idea and you're not and you move on because you you hit a roadblock or whatever like that i feel like for me anyway i feel like it, it makes a lot more sense to actually go back try and overcome the obstacles that are like there and and like actually flush it out and and finish it even if it never comes out to me it's more of like okay i wrote myself into a corner now let's write myself out of it let's use this as a challenge because it might actually sort of I don't know, the similar situation might arise in the future when I'm writing a, another track, which is of better quality. And if I do that with that, then, you know, I, I end up with a winner on my hands rather than yeah. you know, something that was just cast aside because I just thought, oh, whatever, you know? So Yeah. Do you, do you, do you ever have that vision in your head where 
you think this is going to be a huge track. Like I, I can just tell this is it's, it's shaping up to be, and then you put it out there and it doesn't sound anything the way you envisioned it or vice versa. Like you have some throwaway idea, or at least you see it as throwaway. And then you put it out there and you're like, holy shit, this has evolved into something that I was not prepared for. This is great. Yeah. This that's happened quite a few times. Actually. It's, it's, it's funny. Like, um, me and Jeff started this other label called Waveforms, where we yeah. were doing, we were doing. It was it was essentially based on the whole ten inch series. Yeah, that, ten inch. That, yeah, I have a few of those. That Fotech did with the Trooper series. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that that was the that was the idea, and obviously Waveforms was the name of one of his, one of his tracks as well. So that was a little sort of homage, a, a nod to to Rupert and mm -hmm. uh, what he was doing, but um. Those tracks were all just like one session takes. It was, oh, it, it was just very much like going bang an idea down. Don't really kind of think about it too much and just sit on it for a bit and see how it goes. And mm -hmm. and I said that was going to be the idea to to Jeff, and he said, yeah, let's let's see how it goes. And like some of those tracks really kind of sort of blew up and yeah um, and and sometimes that, that's what that's what happens it's like you you kind of don't really think about yeah process too much you just sort of you get in that sort of flow state that autopilot mode and, and you just compose and then bang it's done yeah and and then all of a sudden you know the feedback is holy shit i fucking love this and then you sat there thinking <laughs> <laughs> I only spent like six hours on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's one of the fun things about drum and bass. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, that's just, just how it goes sometimes. Like sometimes you just, you just don't really know what's going to blow up and, yeah. and what's not. And like, there's been several times where I've written tracks, which I, what I thought were like absolute personal sort of milestones for myself. And like, They've just totally gone under the radar. No one's, <laughs> yeah. no one's talked about them all. You know, they've been like uh, track four on a four track EP because <laughs> you know, I just felt they were too far out there or a bit too experimental to be like the A side or whatever like that. So, yeah. And I guess you can never predict how anyone's going to hear your stuff. I mean, with drum and bass, especially, oh. it's about the immediacy of it to some degree. Anyway, like you can take the amen break and speed it up or slow it down or distort it as many times as you want. But sometimes it's just about. Like for me, Rose Without a Thorn, it's about that that uh, sublimated break in the middle. You, you bring away the bass. I mean, you might, you don't have any clue how anyone's going to take that. But for me, that's your signature track now, you know. Um, I think, is that, is that, are you referring to the bit where it kind of goes into almost half time and then the, yes. the half comes in and the bass you, drops out? Yeah, you, you're, you're rocking the 170. And then it, all of a sudden it goes, dum, botch, dum, 160. Yeah. <laughs> You, you basically you cut it you cut it in half essentially um or even more so i don't know but um it, the bottom end is still there but you take the bass out the drums are still there um but it's just that flourish you know that's your signature you know to me that's your track now man um <laughs> yeah so i yeah it's it, i'm always fascinated to hear artists talk about the songs that maybe accidentally blew up when like you said they took a couple of hours to make it and everybody has this really strong reaction to it is, is there any um is there any type of music that you haven't made that you like you know do you have any burning desire to produce a folk artist or something i mean that's just that's a silly example but is there any is there any genre actually, that you haven't experimented with i actually have this burning desire to like, write my own sort of ambient folk piano stuff with me kind of singing oh nice but I i've yet to overcome that irrational fear of hearing myself recorded it just doesn't yeah it's 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 that feel like you know when you're kind of singing you can kind of hear it because of the natural sort of reverb in your skull as it's uh, you know it's, yeah it sounds so much different to like when you put it down you like you, when you hear it on the speakers and you just there's, there's something about that I just haven't overcome yet, and that's why I haven't released any um, anything with my voice on it yet. But I don't know. Perhaps um, 
perhaps that'll come to fruition one day. Perhaps it won't. I don't know. I mean, Yes. it's it's quite, the way I look at it though. It's it's I already do so much like across like multiple genres that if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You know. Right. It's, Yeah. It's not like you have a shortage of ideas. Yeah. 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 It's I, just I hear it's what just you, yeah. I hear what you're saying too when I'm editing my my videos. I hear my voice back at me and I'm like, oh my God, I want to throw up right now. So I get it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, is that really what I sound like all day long? Oh my God. Um, but I'm sure it would be lovely, James, if you ever decide to do that. You yeah can. we'll see we'll see um my friend cynthia keeps like encouraging me to because like she records as uh marine eyes on Oh, yeah. yeah she's absolutely fantastic and um yeah her and her husband james uh james bernard both brilliant musicians in their own right and Yeah. uh but yeah they've both just been encouraging me to try like you know sort of break that um that that Yeah. barrier or whatever you want to call it fiction and, and books Mm -hmm. and stuff like that, or, or even just like art um and something i've been doing recently is just been using um, an ai tool to to generate just pieces of art for no other reason just to look at while i'm kind of writing the music and just get some kind of feedback from that goes into the music and just be inspired by like what i'm seeing and and Mm -hmm. and almost making a soundtrack for that like still image so Yeah. so that that's something that um that helps yeah and uh but i, f I feel like in general these days like other than the obvious influences like you know looking back at the 90s um drum and bass stuff and being influenced by that um i would say it's mainly kind of external to music that where my influences do come from yeah Yeah, I, I'm happy to hear you talk about video games, too, because I think they get unfairly maligned in a lot Yeah, of stuff. I, I feel like most people who are not into them will just say, oh, that's nerdy, or it's like for kids, or it's, it's just, I, I feel sorry for them in a way, because they're, they're depriving themselves from something that's like a real art form. Absolutely, yeah. And I think maybe just because of our age group, too. I mean, we we were raised and weaned on video games, so maybe... Maybe that's part of it, but they've also evolved like any art does. Video games, I think, are better than they've ever been. Um, this reminds me, too. Do you, have you ever played Inside? I feel like you would love Yeah. this. Oh, absolutely incredible. And Limbo. Dude, how how insane was the end of that? I mean, I was in tears. It blew me I, away. I, yeah, I, I was like mouth just like on the floor, Me, just me too. like goosebumps, just like looking at the screen, like, what, Yeah. what did I just witness? What did I just play through? Wow. Yeah. And, Yeah. uh, Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's uh, It's funny, too, because like you, you can never take away the experience of the first time you played through that game. But I played through it again, and my mouth was agape. Again, tears coming out of my eyes at the end of it. I was just like, wow. I mean, obviously, I guess if you look at the world a certain way, that game is going to come off a certain way. But what I, I hope that whoever developed that and, and Limbo, I'm assuming you played Limbo as well, which is brilliant. I hope they're working on a new game. I haven't heard anything about this. I think so. Yeah, they're, I think it's Play Dead Studios. I think they're out of it's a Scandinavian country. It might be Sweden. I think it's Sweden. Yeah, Yeah. but, um, but yeah, I I can't wait to see what they come up with next because Oh. both those games were just absolutely monumental experiences. Absolutely. I mean, when I, so you'll take this as a compliment, like the same gears in my mind work when I play inside and I listen to your music, if that makes any sense. It's the same emotional mechanism that I have when I experience those two things, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, Yeah, I guess I guess so, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an emotional response. And to me, you know, as you live on this earth longer and longer, it's maybe a little harder to experience those emotional responses. So your music absolutely brings that to me. So. Yeah, I, I suppose we get worn down from experiences over time and then, you know, that that kind of fascination of like what you kind of experienced the first time around it's harder to replicate but but yeah i, I think that's i'm always trying to do that with my music though i'm always just trying to i just want people to feel or just just to sort of connect with it in in on the deepest sort of level 
mm-hmm. rather than rather than just be okay this just came on our spotify asc okay cool yeah nice look cool next tune I, I, you know that's yeah. cool as well but I, at the same time i just i want people to to explore it like it's its own world yeah. and, and to, to sort of go back and re-listen and find the little extras and the little yeah. hidden or, or you know or or even find some deeper meaning out of it or something you, you know it's, it's it yeah. might even it might sound pretentious to say that i don't know but no it doesn't um i, I don't know I, I i feel like um i'm always just trying to tell stories anyway and, and yeah it's yeah. you're not sounding pretentious at all like when isolated systems came out that came out right in the middle of covid and i yes, said you've, right. you've done that right leading up to the beginning of covid right or maybe during it, I don't know. I, I it think came, it was. I think it was. Hmm. Let me think. I I have a distinct memory of first hearing that album when COVID was maybe a couple months old, and I didn't listen to it very closely because I just I don't know the 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 stress of the world was making me anxious, you know. And then I yes. listened to it about a year later, and I was like, Jesus Christ, this is amazing! Like, yeah, I, I hear it then. I felt like I was trying to write a very dystopian kind of sounding yeah. album that was that was almost kind of sort of end of the world kind of well, theme. You, su- you Cause, succeeded, cause that's, man. Because that's what you know, that's what it felt like at the time, didn't it? Hell it was yeah. like all the lockdown, not being able to go out, and you know, just yep. just the way everything was going, all the corruption happening in the world, and yeah. it was just. I guess that was like my answer to that. And yeah, I'm glad that that translated in such a way. Oh, that... Absolutely. Yeah. It's it, when I think of an album, when I think of COVID and I think of, I mean, this is going to sound terrible, but take this as a compliment. I mean, it's isolated systems. It's um, at least for the first, the first year it was isolated systems because during that first year of COVID too, we had that, you know, we had a new presidential election here in the United States and, and that yeah. was winding down. So it was a very stressful year for everybody. I mean, not just Americans, but everyone across the world. So mm. that was one of those albums where, like you said, you like people digging in and excavating and doing some spelunking work with your music. And I did that with Isolated Systems. I didn't hear it initially. When I first heard it, I was like, okay yeah all right it's all right and then a year later i listened to it and i was like wow like why didn't i appreciate this at the time i think i was just so stressed i didn't have enough bandwidth mentally yeah Yeah, that that makes sense that makes sense i think it was like that for for most people though because i I feel like it was that time was just very hard to be a casual listener if that makes sense because there was just so much shit going on and it was it's just, it was just a horrible time and i feel it was great for the artists because yeah we had no, nothing we, we had nothing to do other than record you know it was like okay you, you're stuck at home so just just create and so yeah i was just um i think i wrote about like about three albums in in the space of that whole lockdown. I like mm-hmm. I did the um, the piano ambient one on a strangely isolated place called Original Soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. I did that one, and then I did obviously did Isolated Systems first, and then um, then there's Colors of Absence, another ambient album that I put out on Auxiliary, which um, mm-hmm. and they they all came from the same kind of. Um, same kind of claustrophobic kind of feeling of like just being yeah. being told to like stay inside and like okay this is your life now that kind of you know that that kind of vibe you know yeah like the, if there's a through line with your music i was talking before about it i like the idea that when i hear when i hear an album I'm like wow that was made by that was made by the same person and that was made but the one through line with your music is that claustrophobic angle like your music um it's dark. I don't know. I think it is. Maybe you don't think it is, but there's a darkness to it that I think drum I think and some, an ambient definitely needs. I think some stuff is. I feel like the spatial stuff is more... Yeah, that's more... It's, hard, 
yeah yeah it's 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 almost like i'm trying to think like the best way to it's shimmering you know that maybe sounds really yeah. trivial but yeah. that's perhaps, stuff yeah, is... those are perhaps the the spatial stuff is the stars and the sky and then like yep. isolated systems is the black hole really absolutely and yes that's, that's that's probably a good way to look it's at it. It's very, it's very warm. Like in oral imbalance yeah. stuff is fucking brilliant too, man. Um, yeah. yeah. The, the the synth work, the the warmness of it, it almost sounds or, more organic, you know. Um, it, there's still a darkness to it, but that's probably just what I bring to it. I mean, that's generally how I look at the world, anyway. So, yeah, I, Simon's Simon's very similar to myself in like, you know, he's um, a very emotional person. He's he's very um, wears his heart on his sleeve, that type of thing. And, and he he does this, he does the exact same thing. It's it's just catharsis for him. Just like you know, he has to sort of get it out of him. And like that's how it transpires into such deep, like, heartfelt emotive music. And and that's that's why, you know, he he's become like well, from the start, he was an integral part of like why I created spatial pretty much. Yeah. I someone when I talked about you on my YouTube channel, someone thought that oral imbalance was you. There, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that Clement? Isn't that a Clement's side project? I'm like, I know, but I think that just that goes a long way in, in describing that you look for that singular vision on your label because yeah, I don't I'll think it sounds it. anything. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it sounds like you, but I think the spirit's there, um, and that's really what a record label is to me. It's keeping an eye. Yeah, on yeah. It's. I mean, yeah. It's. It's just about for me. It's all. All about finding. You know. Finding yourself in other people, essentially. Yeah. And and, and that's. That's what I think spatial is all about, really. And yeah, that's, I mean, that's I, what's that what human that's what humanity is all about, right? Right. I mean, just finding mm. fucking anything, anyone that can mm. relate on some on some level. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, and that's what I love about your music, James. Um, it's, uh, I, I mean, I'm not trying to wrap this up, but um, uh, it's been great talking to you. I could talk to you all day. I don't know what your time, I don't know what your time span is like right now. I'm not doing anything for the rest of the day, so it's, okay. if you got more questions, keep them. See, keep see, see, my Catholic guilt is sinking in right now. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm atheist, but I was raised Catholic, so. Um, right. I look at the time. I'm like, I've been keeping this poor bastard for two fucking hours now. He he's too nice to tell me that he doesn't want to do this anymore. Um, yeah. So back back to your recording techniques. What I loved about Brian Eno and going back to Eno is um, his ability to uh, change gears and and be okay with that. Like one of the oblique strategies on his. If people don't know what the oblique strategies were, he would include these little cards set of cards weren't they with tips on like yes. how to yeah how to like freshen up your workflow and stuff yeah and some of the tips were just so so dreadfully painfully trivial and boring but that's that's really what being a human being is all about right i mean you have to rise above that dreck that emotional dreck to get to those high places and i thought i thought that's what always always yeah. oblique strategies were about like well yeah how do I get to this place? Stop taking yourself so damn seriously. And yeah. Then, so you could also see it as like, you know, just, I mean, I remember what, there was like one that was like, it was almost a meme before it was a meme before that was a thing. And it was just said something like use filters. And, yeah. And like, I remember like everyone was like, well, that's just so fucking obvious, you know, but, <laughs> but if you think about it, is it? Yeah. Is it really that obvious? Because like you, you could be in the middle of like a workflow or something of, of of putting a track down, and then you know that adding just that filter at like that one precise moment could be that little trick that you know sends that track to the next level, or you know just I don't know. It's it's a basic example, but you know it, it's I feel like I feel like they all had merit, even if they were simple. Yeah, well, and yeah, to me, like his, he always called his music environmental music. And I understand what he means by that. It, like what you were just describing, music is environmental, like everything we do all day, 
whether it's relationships with other human beings or whatever level it is, that's what music is, right? Like when yeah. I've recorded a little bit, no, obviously nowhere near the level you have, but um, sometimes that's what it's about. It's about just dropping everything you, you think you're supposed to be doing. You're engulfed in all this technology and you just have to remember how to be a human being again. And to me, yeah. that's what environmental music is. Yeah, I feel like there's also like the the aspect of like allowing yourself to be vulnerable, like yeah. open, just putting yourself out there with. I mean, I I I used to get like affected negatively if like I would see something like you know someone I don't know perhaps someone wrote a review or something and then and they didn't get it or something like that and then it was only like years later I'd, I'd start thinking well. Perhaps it just wasn't for them. Like it doesn't matter. Like you know, mm -hmm. at, at least I kind of put myself out there, and like those that got it, they got it, and and that's that's all that matters, really. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. but you know, as you know, being an artist, you, you open yourself up to interpretation, to like people reading into it any way they want, or you know, taking. They can take things out of context. They can completely misunderstand what your intentions were, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that's, that's, it's all part and parcel of it, really. It's just one of those things you've got to kind of accept. And um, I think the, the longer you do it, the more you feel comfortable with that. Yeah. I was going to ask you, like, was that something? Was that something you had difficulty with early on? I would assume, yeah, yes. yeah. Very, very much early on, because I, I, I think, I mean, like like any producer, like when you're first starting out, I mean, you're nowhere near as good as you are now. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. you know having like, speaking for myself, I've got like you know twenty five plus years experience of writing now. Yeah, yeah. So possibly a bit more if I include like all the early days in high school etc of like learning to do stuff but um early on you kind of perhaps it's just that thing with age as well like the naivety of like being young and then like putting music out and thinking you know that you're on top of the world etc and and, mm -hmm. and then someone brings you back down to earth you know because mm -hmm. they, they that pat you in a review or whatever like that and um but yeah i, I feel like you know the more mature you get, the more life experience you get, the more you you just don't really care anymore. It's because you know that the people that truly understand it and get it, those are the people that you you're wanting yeah. to from anyway. So it doesn't really matter. So it all just becomes background noise essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was gonna ask how much you know, how how many times you read your reviews anymore anyway. I would I would assume you care on some level, but I definitely care. I, it's, I definitely care in the point that it's really nice to know that what I'm doing has touched someone or like has really helped them through some some dark times or like they're just connecting on the same level as like what I'm intending to put out. Mm -hmm. So that's that's all very meaningful and stuff like that. But um, when it comes to like sort of media reviews and stuff like that. I tend not to search them out. Like I'll, sometimes I'll come across them or, you know, sometimes someone will link them or, you know, I'll get tagged in, you know, a tweet or something like that. And, right. And and, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, then I end up getting curious and reading it like, like anyone would do, but yeah, but yeah, most, most of the time these days I'm, I'm usually just, if I've, if I've satisfied myself with, with, the effort I've put in and like the final product, then that's that's more than enough. That's more than it's good. That's good enough for me. Yeah, YouTube. I I really enjoy YouTube in 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 the aspect that they you know they've been arm's length in terms of me saying what I want to say. And and you're not you're not the only person to reach out to me on the channel either. I mean, it's happened a couple of times, and I I love that because. Um, I feel like when I watch reviews on YouTube, they're coming from real people. They're not coming from someone who's getting paid to have some lofty opinion of something they really didn't listen to in the first place. On YouTube, mm -hmm. it's people really having a visceral, emotional, personal experience with something. So, um, 
Yeah, I, I would think that on YouTube, I would want to seek out <laughs> what people were saying about me because it's real people having a, a immediate reaction. Yeah, it was my friend Dan who um, who I run another label with called Curvature. We've just started that, and that's um, similar to Spatial, but it's more of like a we kind of sort of call it like a testing ground, so we can bring newer artists in we can self-help sort of develop um lesser known names etc and and that's that's something that me and him are doing but he's he's been watching you for some time and um we have a little group chat with um a bunch of our friends who all grew up in you know listening to the 90s dmb stuff and um he posted um i think it was when you because when you reviewed the depths of space, yeah, and yeah. and he said, "Oh, have you, have you have you checked this guy out?" And I said, uh, "No, I haven't really heard of him. I'm like, I'll, I'll go check it out." And um, I ended up going back through all of your other videos and just like just, just hearing what you had to say about like you know music I hadn't heard of and stuff like that. And it was just it just felt like you had this sort of personal connection with the music that you felt strongly enough that you you really had to sort of talk about it in in a way and and i feel like perhaps it exists on youtube i don't know but i'm i'm not that privy to it if it does anyway so it, it was kind of refreshing in a way so i was i was glad that i um i came across it yeah thanks james yeah i i would never compare myself to someone who who produces the music you do but i i feel that compulsion that you have with music you know there's this especially music that i don't think people are hearing because at youtube all you need to do is put the beatles or pink floyd or whatever in in the title of your video and you're going to get hits by default and i'm not you know I, I like the beatles and pink floyd as much as anybody does but there's other music out there and um i i'm compelled to talk about it i because yeah. to me it's about reaching out to people like those connections you were talking about um to me, if I could just, if I could help someone, just one person find out about James Clements, for example, not to talk about you, you in the third person, you're right here, but you get what I'm saying. Like if, yeah. if one more person is turned on to you and can listen to you, then that makes my day. So, um, but when yeah. people like yourself reach out to me, that really makes my day. So. <laughs> Well, yeah. we got my friend Dan to thank for that. <laughs> well, hey, thank you. Thank Dan for me, too. Uh, yeah, maybe he'll watch this. I don't know. but um, oh, he'll, he'll definitely be watching. Oh, cool. Oh. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I want to keep this shit alive, James. I mean, like when I made yeah. the Joseph Space video, again, the compulsion was there. I'm like, I want to talk about this record. I, I think people should hear it because this is representing a time this music is representing a time that i think is a little bit forgotten now we can talk about drum and bass all we want but then here's this like you really yeah. want to know what shit sounded like and listen to this and it's even better so yeah and that that album especially that one was just such a a joy to to do because um i'm not sure if you know about like the origins of overshadow but it's um simon and sean from two bad mice who, right. uh, who right. used to do the a and r for moving shadow yeah absolutely so and obviously um sean used to write as a well still does as deep blue as well so mm -hmm. he, he wrote they both wrote some absolute classics and and they were they were pretty much heroes of mine growing up i mean i loved their music i loved moving shadow i loved everything about it and, um, oh, yeah. and to be to be working with these guys now and, and to be part of this label and you know having done an album for them it was it's just just it just it's just everything that i ever wanted like from you know those early days it was it was just it all come full circle for me so it was it was very very um, fulfilling to do that. yeah exciting i moving shadow again was one of those labels i just bought it it didn't matter what it was i didn't same. need to same same i i think i'm missing probably about 10 to 15 records from the first hundred I've, I've nearly got them all <laughs> i think i'm the same i think maybe i'm missing a dozen um yeah. and you know what i don't know that they're that hard to find either uh, they, i probably should have them but yeah my favorites are just general this random ones too like you remember 
what was it the process they were having like their hundredth release i don't know there was like a hundred it was like a jubilee release for their hundredth release and it right, was yeah. who who did the re it was someone unusual it was, like rick it was rick smith, smith from, from underworld, underworld. yes yeah. The Bing here mix, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, brilliant. Because I was huge, a huge Underworld fan. Same, um, yeah. And then Rick Smith did that, and again, it was like, what? Like, I, I, to my, he hadn't really done a lot of drum and bass up to that point, but it was like, wow, this is stunning stuff, man. Um, that mm. was just, that might be one of my favorites. I mean, it's just, it's an odd choice probably, but yeah, those Rick Smith mixes, man. Um, Maybe that's my underworld love coming out, but yeah, underworld were fantastic. Though I mean, another big influence as well. Oh, really? Just, okay. just the way, yeah, just the way they were able to sort of manipulate the sort of synth work into that sort of type of techno without it sounding cheesy. Yeah, to me, was like kind of genius, to be honest. And considering where they came from, too. Um you know their 80s their 80s history um you, oh, they were kind of a rock band weren't they or something yeah their, their initial band was Froor. Froor. it was f-r-e-u-r it was like a squiggle right. mark. they did the squiggle mark before prince did the squiggle mark um <laughs> they revolutionized the squiggle mark um but then they turned into uh you know like a synth poppy band known as underworld and then they brought Darren Emerson in, and he kind of he shook it all up. Yeah, yeah, brilliant stuff. I, I remember second toughest in the infants, just like oh. the first time I put that on, and just sat there, just like, okay, how do you make this? Because this is like, <laughs> <laughs> this yeah, blowing me away. How do how are you doing this? this the the first half an hour, it was just two tracks. Remember, it was that first Juanita song, like sixteen minutes. And then they did that band style track after that, which is like a 15 minute drum and bass track, but then it cuts the. Oh, then he goes into the down tempo thing at the end, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. See, now yeah. I need to go listen to that record. Jesus. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Thanks, man. I really appreciate appreciate that. Let's stay in touch, man. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. And I'll. I'll do... um, what's that? Um, then we can always just do future Zoom calls or whatever and just like chat shit, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. No, I'd be, I'd totally be into that. Um, and I hope you don't mind if I reach out to you. If I, I go to California every once in a while, so I hope you don't mind I reach out to you when I go down there. Yeah, I'm up for that, yeah. Be okay, great. cool. All, All right. right. Good to talk All to right, you. Good. Nice one, man. Here. See you later.